You know what? Every time I want you to cut something out, I'm just gonna say something super racist. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, I'll just cut the racist bit. Iron Man, what do you think overall? Give me a quick summary, just to start, and then we'll go into it a bit deeper. Slow to start, too long. That's that's my quick summary of it. All right, okay. D- did you enjoy it once it started going? Well, or? Uh, you know, after, yeah, after the first hour, it got pretty good. Uh, but I have to say that first hour was a bit of a struggle. All right, fair enough. Right, well, probably a good good idea just to start at the start then and see what you liked and what you didn't like about it. Now, obviously, the opening scene is them and the Humvees with the nameless army folk. You like that? I, I actually really enjoyed that. I thought that was a cool scene because it was kind of lighthearted and fun and everyone seemed quite human. It seemed totally disconnected from the war zone going on around them. And then suddenly, <laughs> bang. <death. laughs> yeah. Like, and it was just instantaneous and just... You know, the action started, the whole scene changed. I mean, he saw that someone who'd just spoken to you get gunned down in front of him, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I really liked that. I liked yeah. that bit. Well, I've always thought that that's a really good opening because it sets up that he's a funny and charismatic guy. Obviously, they're sitting there trying to be very professional and he's like, you're allowed to talk, by the way. <laughs> it's just... Yeah, he makes them, he disarms them, yeah. for want of a better word. Yeah. He's armed them, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> and in Back in Black as well, as an option for music, is just you know, if you're going to show a character's cool, <laughs> have them live to ACDC. <laughs> yeah, I, I I noticed that. I liked the music. I did like the music in the opening scene, and then it just did. It hung, did the music stop when the explosion went off? Yes, and then yeah, it, yeah. So it, there was just this whole shift in the the whole feel of the scene as soon as that happened. It was good. Yeah, I think. I think the dialogue as well is, is meant to disarm you while introducing you to Tony Stark. It's to disarm you and get you laid back, quite comfortable, just thinking, oh, this is a, this is a character scene. No, you, you don't get character scenes that comfortably in this war zone. Then you get the Iron Man title card and then it, it goes to a 36 hours earlier to give you a bit of an indication of how we got there. I'm generally not a fan of that. The, uh, the the 36 hours earlier but I think it worked in this one See, I, I, I normally don't like knowing the punchline yeah. before I get told the story but I liked it in this one it did really kind of give you a you know give you a backstory a bit for the moment so yeah you get the 36 hours earlier you get a, a large expo- exposition dump in the form of a video describing Tony Stark's life did you notice that that was all exposition or did you feel it was done well enough that you just sort of absorb the information. I didn't think of it as a, I knew it was exposition, but like you say, I just kind of it was just part of the story to me. They Fair were just enough. because I don't know that much about the Marvel universe. It it was giving me key information. Yeah, I get that. Um, so I mean, I, the, f- I was the first time I watched it, I felt the same. It was just obviously now that I'm rewatching it, I'm like, oh my god, that is like two and a half minutes of them just telling you things and not really showing you anything. <laughs> Yeah, but for me it was like, all oh, right, okay, that's who he is. His dad actually sounded like quite a cool guy, <laughs> considering he designed a nuclear weapon. He's, he's pretty <laughs> cool. He seemed nice. Yeah, I mean he's a he's a good guy. You see him later on in the MCU, so you you'll learn a bit about him. If he um, turns out not to be a nice guy. I'm gonna point at this this whole recording and go, "You lied to me." <laughs> Maybe I'm just uh, throwing your red herons in that just to keep you on your toes. I swear to God, if I end up crying on this podcast, man. <laughs> you're not going to cry at this maybe later on in the MCU once you're attached to people not right now though also in that scene you get introduced to Rhodey and uh, Obadiah Stane Obadiah straight away with a name like Obadiah I knew he wasn't a nice person <laughs> um, but he just had that comic book villain kind of vibe if that, that works like he just seemed straight away I knew he was a bad guy there was no there was no subtleness you could tell this guy was an asshole. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean... He was very false and corporate and kind of passive-aggressive and just... I just didn't like him from the get-go. What about Rhodey, did you... I liked Rhodey. He almost seemed a bit side... He is, I suppose it's a superhero movie. He was a bit sidekicky, but... Yeah. I wanted to see more of Rhodey, to be quite honest. Yeah. 
I kind of wish that he'd been the one that he was with throughout the the, the next kind of sequence. I almost wish he'd been there with him rather than just off in the distance somewhere looking for him. Well, yeah. I mean, they did make that reference. Yeah, I know. And it wasn't... When they made that reference, I instantly thought that would have been so much fucking better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Someone in the writer room went, yeah, that was my original idea, but you assholes went with this one. <laughs> you made a mistake, boys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just going to show the audience that I thought there was a cooler idea in there. But, you know. And I picked up... Well, I'm not saying that was intentional, but I, as soon as he said that, I went, yeah, that would have been so much fucking better. <laughs> No, I, I'm not going to disagree with that. I mean, I overall, I don't really like this Roddy, especially looking back on it. I don't think I had that much of a problem the first time watching. Spoiler alert, that actor isn't in any more films. <laughs> they recast him. Um, oh, yeah, 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 because I've seen him in... I've, I remember seeing him in other Iron Man stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's a different guy, so... It's an interesting little exposition dump, and they're obviously just leading up to that that 36 hours later moment you then have the reporter approach Stark outside the casino and they have a bit of to and fro. You see him be very sarcastic but also very charming but very forward. Like, I... Yeah, I, I honestly think if Tony Stark existed in the real world, you know the Me Too movement would have come down with him like a ton of bricks. Eh? <laughs> yeah. like, there's definitely some skeletons in that closet. Oh yeah, but... oh yeah. It shows you him standing up for what he does as a business overall. Like when he, he mentions about the crops and stuff like that. Um, okay, it's military funded, but he's like, if we didn't have the military funding, then we wouldn't be able to do that. It get, almost shows a a less self-centered version of him. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you can see that even though he's a weapons dealer, there's good within him, but... Not really at, feel... this, at this moment in time. Yeah, th- at yeah. that moment, that's just something that he's... I think they even reference it. It's almost like it's something he practices in the mirror. It's what he t- it's, it's something he tells himself. Yeah, I think so. You've, you've got without getting too deep, you've 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 got to look at the fact that oh, our weapons have helped kill millions of people over the years. But you know, smart crops. Yeah. You know, it, it, the ends don't justify the actual means of getting the money. I think he's also in his mind. He's got the the balance of well, it's the U.S. Army that's got them, so they're fighting for freedom. So that makes it okay. Yeah, I mean, he later finds out that it's not just the US Army that have them. And he changes his opinion based on that. But at the moment, he's, he's almost been naive in that he believes that it's only the US Army that are getting to use his weapons, which is very unlikely. <laughs> yeah, considering, especially once once kind of weapons are out there, you know, people are going to steal shipments. I mean, governments, even the US government sell weapons to people, so... Once they own them, they can sell them on to whoever they want. And things like yeah. this, they diffuse all uh, around the world quite quickly. So, yeah. I think Plus, as soon as, as soon as one gets away from the US Army, <coughs> you'll see a lot of replicas and rip-offs made. But you managed to better. Hashtag yeah, score. I mean, I mean, it's pretty... The thing is, I would be more impressed by that if he wasn't uh, an extremely attractive billionaire standing <laughs> outside his sports car. With yeah. him, like a, a retinue of servants with him. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but if you can't get laid with all that around you, then you'd be as well hand it in. You'd be as well hand it back to the manufacturer today because you're not using it. Yeah, I get you. Um, it does lead to a good scene the next morning where you're introduced to, to Pepper Potts um, and the voice of Jarvis. Do you like Gwyneth Paltrow's Pepper? I, I really liked it. I thought that her and uh, Robert Downey Jr. had a lot of chemistry together on set. Yeah, I, yeah, I thought I, that too. Especially in the flirtier scenes, like you almost believed that, that that's the kind of performance together that makes you think they were <laughs> behind scene, even though they weren't. <laughs> yeah, but it it was so good that and the chemistry between them was so good that I think if neither of them had a romantic partner, they would have been behind the scenes quite possibly quite possibly well you know if she could find time to put a dick in there when she's not steaming her vagina you know <laughs> but anyway, I, mean, uh, I thought i thought i thought she was so good i forgot she was going at paltrow i like the, the the first scene down in the garage um where pepper's talking about her birthday and stuff like that and he's like being a little bit flirty but she's been quite flirty back but it's almost like a 
it feels like that's a natural working relationship. Like, that doesn't seem out of the norm to me. Yeah, um, no, I, I thought that was just a rapport. I didn't think that, yeah. was, that was for strength. And we all have rapports like that with certain people in our lives. Yeah. Where... It's nice to know that you can have a character in a film have a relationship like that with somebody else and not and feel I never as felt if at it's. At any point that she was pining for him. Yeah, exactly. Which would have been a really easy way to go. They seemed very equally matched and there was equal respect in that kind of relationship. Yeah, exactly. He was her boss, but it didn't feel like he was just trying to bang his secretary. And yeah. she didn't seem like the stereotypical secretary who just wants to bang her boss. Yeah. I, I, I thought I thought they nailed that relationship. Then we move on to the scene where he gets on a plane, um, a reintroduction to Rhodey, and you see Rhodey is, is, is in a bit of a mood. I mean, rightly so. Because I mean, it does say that he left for three hours. Three hours, man. That is. That, that's like that time you left me uh, waiting for stream for twenty minutes, or something like that, <laughs> wasn't it? And then logged on and found out that your game hadn't updated. Yeah, I, I you know something. I really related to Rhodey. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way that uh, Tony managed to trick him into having a a hot sake. I thought that was quite good because he was like, "I'm not drinking," and then Tony's like, "Well, you probably should," and he's like, "No, I'm not drinking." And then it smash cuts to him <laughs> holding the sake bottle by the neck. Yeah. I liked that. That was pretty good. Although there was a, a really, really stupid line from Roddy in this scene. I don't know if you noticed it, but I noticed it. And I noticed it the first time I watched it and I was like, did I hear that right? What and then now whenever I hear it, I just basically just start to myself. He said, you need your diaper changed. Let me know and I'll get you a bottle. Yeah, I did that. That re- registered in my head, and I just kind of shook it off. I just yeah. seems really stupid. Uh, I'm not experienced in diaper changing methods, right? And this could well, just be an American there. thing, but I don't think a bottle's needed. <laughs> yeah, it was just one. Of, yeah, it was almost like you know when you're 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 coming up with a comeback yourself. <laughs> and halfway through, you realise that you've not really finished it in your head, ah, it's so it not just comes work. out with a bit, and I'll, I'll get, and I'll get you a bottle. Like it just, <laughs> yeah, it just. I thought some of the dialogue in the film was a bit like that, to be honest. Yeah, uh, I think I that's was, uh... especially in the first hour. It's a bit clunky because they were trying to introduce everyone and establish personalities. Yeah, and th- none I... of the actors have been playing them long enough to actually establish personality. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with that. I mean, it's it's quite clear at the start that the the concept of the MCU wasn't expected from this film. Like, they obviously wanted to have them linked, but I don't think they thought it was going to be quite as successful and quite as well loved as this. So, there's a groundwork put down for a shared universe, but it's not. It doesn't feel like they've went. No, we really need to hammer this home and get characters where you're introduced to them in one film and you don't really know much about them like they, it felt as if they wanted to get every character a personality early on in this film so that this film made sense uh, on its own rather than spending so much time in other films building characters that you didn't really know much about in this film whereas if you look at some of the more modern films like i, I told you i recently watched thor ragnarok and like doctor strange just appeared yeah like, exactly for want of a better word and he just did his bit and then disappeared again. Yeah. And I was like, I can tell this character like has like you know, I can tell this character's established, but I didn't need his full backstory in this film. Can I talk about the first part of the film? Um yeah, what I mean I genuinely thought of the first hour. Yeah, go for it. Well the first forty minutes sucked. What what would you say is the first forty minutes? Where just as an indication, where does that go up into stamp of forty minutes? It's it's just it's kinda just where they finish building the the kind of rough Iron Man suit in that cave. The Mark One, yeah. Just about to break out and, and kind of get away and stuff. And I actually checked the time index on the film. That's how I know it was like 40 minutes in. Um, right, okay. Because I, I genuinely thought we were coming towards the end of the film. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, I, I think it was hope. I, I felt like I'd been watching the film for well over an hour. That would have been a really film as well yeah, it's just exactly. well yeah that's where it was escapes a cave and then cuts to credits <laughs> what annoyed me is obviously you know after the events in the in the, the humvee he gets captured by terrorists for want of a better word yeah taken away their their underground layer in the mountains right and 
is basically told, is given a pile of recovered military hardware and scrap, for want of a better word, and told to build one of the most advanced weapon systems that are currently on the market. <laughs> right? And no time frames given at all. Right? Like, yeah. you know, just, just build this in a cave with, like, next to no... Like, with a welder and a, and a friend. <laughs> like, right? But power of friendship can do a lot for you. <laughs> the, power, the, the, the power of friendship should not be underestimated, right? But they didn't even try and make it look like they were designing a missile like he they're watching him intently on cameras i'm sorry if i was a terrorist leader i'd have two people in that room at all times documenting what he was doing right he didn't even build like a missile fuselage or fuck all no launch system he didn't even make it look like he was designing a missile he's literally building a suit of armor honestly if that first 40 minutes didn't happen, I think I would have still enjoyed the movie. I just I, I and they I don't know where they're where you want me to put where you want to put this bit in, but the I really like the dynamic between the the doctor Jensen. Jensen. And I and Tony Stark. I thought that was a really good dynamic. Yeah. And I know they kind of cleared it up later as to why he would do that. But, you know, you spend this time establishing that he's got a family. It kind of makes him a real person rather than just a side character. It kind of humanizes the whole situation, which I think is really... You're kind of seeing it from Tony Stark's point of view where war isn't some distant off thing that with cool explosions and, yeah. and, and gunfire. It's a human experience. And I think it helps to show him that it's a human experience. But then when they're uploading the software into the, into the suit, to like make their getaway he's like we need more time i will buy you some time and he grabs a machine gun and just runs down a corridor <laughs> right now that just felt so out of character it's like you've just established that this man is looking forward to seeing his family again that he's yeah humble he doesn't even shoot at them he just yeah. shoots up at this guy and these guys are running away these are hardened warriors running away from a skinny guy with a submachine gun shooting at a ceiling yeah right it was just so out of character, and I know, spoiler alert, that when Tony finds him later on, and he's lying, he's bleeding out, he's like, my family are already dead, I'm going to meet them, blah, 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 right? It was just so pointless. Yeah. He could have stood at the door with a machine gun and, and put down some cover fire or some shit. He didn't need to chase them through the... Oh, it just really annoyed me. Yeah. <laughs> I think they wanted him out of the room so that the, the powering up of the suit was... <laughs> Kind of like the horror movie vibe of a dark room. You know nothing about what's going on in that room. Obviously, it's not framed as a horror film for us because we as an audience know exactly what's happening. But, you know, for those terrorists that walk into that room trying to find Stark after the bombs exploded and they're looking around and then the light just goes on in his chest. Like, one guy gets punched across the room. Which, by the way, another dumb thing happens here where... He punches one guy across the room and the rest of them just start shooting into this room yeah. filled with materials from missiles. Yeah, <laughs> like, I know, right? That's a room filled with TNT and you're just like, yeah, what could go wrong? Let's just kill the thing. But, <laughs> uh, like, here's another thing, right? And this is... I'm, I'm really interested in, like, World War One history and all the rest of it, right? And in World War One, it was, like, the last war where you actually saw people wear thick you know, suits of armor, yep. right? Like, literal, like, huge fucking, like, juggernaut suits from Call of Duty, like, that kind of thing, but just, like, old-timey steel, right? Yep. And have you any idea how thick a piece of steel has to be to stop, a like, a high-powered round? Yeah. Like, yeah, no, it just seemed a bit dumb. Well, I, I, I obviously, I, I don't know how, I don't know what, his bombs were made of because you you've got to assume that the outside of that Mark One was the outside of a missile. In which case, you know you could yada yada it being a different material than steel, and you could yada yada the idea that I mean that was very all of the pieces of metal were very curvy, so maybe the bullets are instead of just being stopped being deflected by the shape of the metal like i get what you're saying but i mean it's a superhero film you've got to have some sort of semblance of 
yeah, I let in the realism, realism go. And I can understand it with the one he builds later on, the the new and improved. Yep. Built in a lab with the most up to date technology and all the rest of it. I can I can feel that. But yeah, I don't know. I just I liked it visually. I thought it was awesome. I thought this is great. He's he's managed to techno his way out of this situation. He's invented this amazing. <laughs> I just imagine somebody system. like raving their way out of a situation to techno music. <laughs> Like a DJ bad boy or something in the background. Just walking down the corridor, like <laughs> giving it the moonwalk, and I'm like, tss, tss, tss. <laughs> no, I, I I get what you mean. I could have done with it being a bit more rough shot. Okay, maybe like. I mean, it was it was shot to be a a bit clunky as walking, and you know he gets his arm stuck in the the cave wall, and that guy ends up killing himself by shooting him square in the helmet. I mean, there's. There's small plot holes and contrivances that you've got to just sort of accept when you're watching these films, but I do understand that sometimes they can feel a bit a bit silly. I mean, this is probably the most realistic hero out of them all, is the guy yeah, in a, in a, a metal suit. Um, everyone else has more fantastical things, so you're willing to to let that slide a bit more. But yeah, I can understand how this one... I mean, you're, you're going to have to let more things slide than that in future films, oh, yeah, otherwise you're... I- you're gonna I, hate I, I, them I all. I just, I think it was because the first forty minutes for me were so boring. But the flamethrowers were added purely for coolness. But like, that's such a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Where did he get all the gasoline? How did he? I, yep. Yeah, I'm just... completely on board with that. That uh, complaint is the the yeah. Him just setting fire to all the missiles in front of him. Like, he didn't even wait till he was past them and blow them up behind him. He, he, lo- he was walking towards them, blowing them up. And it's like, those are missiles, by the way. I mean... Yeah, and flamethrowers are just a bad idea. Well, yeah. In general. Like, yeah. They look cool, though. But yeah, for cool points, I'd give it, like, a 9, right? It needed that. But I was just sitting there, like, going, why the f*** would you have flamethrowers? But I suppose they couldn't... Right, ignore that. That's a total bullshit point. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Insert something racist here. Um. <laughs> I did like the fact that the... Um, you you probably won't know this, but the terrorist group is called the Ten Rings, which links... Is that because of the, the guard? The, the, um, was the, their captain not wearing like loads of rings? Like, um, he had one. Um, he had a tattoo on his neck that was Ten Rings. Um, the reason why I was quite happy to see that is because it hints towards a Iron Man villain called the Mandarin, um, who leads a terrorist organization called the Ten Rings. Um, oh, okay. I really like that just as a throwaway bit, because obviously they weren't going to do him as a villain. I mean, this was reasonably close to the release of the Dark Knight films, so there were a lot of the superhero films were going for the realistic point of view. So I think with the start of the MCU, they were trying to do heroes that were believable, a little bit fantastical, but nothing really unexplainable. So, for example, they start off with with uh, Iron Man. You've got Incredible Hulk, which is radiation poisoning, effectively. Um, you've got Captain America, which is a super serum, which, I mean, if you're willing to let a little bit slide, you can believe that. Um then you've got Thor, which is more fantastical, but you're you're led to believe in that film that it's not magic, it's science that we just don't understand yet. Yeah. So they were going for almost the, the sort of realistic side, so I can understand why they didn't do the Mandarin, because the Mandarin's powers, it, it gets, as far as I'm aware, it gets them from Ten Rings that he has, which is why his terrorist organisation is called the Ten Rings. And the Rings let him do different magical things. So I can understand why they didn't use him as a villain. But it's kind of good that, like, that was a really good, like, callback reference for yeah. Marvel fans who were aware of that. Exactly. But at the same time, it was a callback reference that for the casual fan like myself, it didn't interrupt the flow of the story. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you wouldn't have even noticed. Uh, no, no, not he, at all. I think Jensen says it in the cave. He's like, they, they call themselves the Ten Rings. And it's like, anyone that cares, or not cares, anyone that knows would be like, ah, oh, it's the Ten Rings. And anyone who doesn't know would just be like, okay, and they're going to the Ten Rings. Like, fine. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we we have the escape scene. I thought it looked good. 
I do sort of agree that the the first act of the film's a bit slow, could do with being a bit shorter. But I felt like they did a good a good job at introducing each character. Um, that might have slowed it down, but you know, they, it was clearly not a polished film at this point. They didn't have a formula to follow at this stage in the in the game. Um, you could tell it was an early film in the in the series. The yeah. earliest, isn't it? Yeah. So he run, returns home, he sees Pepper, and he has a little joke about her saying that she hates job searching and stuff, <laughs> which I can completely get, by the way. Oh, job yeah. searching like is, like, her. the worst. <laughs> um, and then he says that he wants to uh, he wants to get some cheeseburgers, and he wants to call a press conference where he states that Stark Industries are no longer going to create and sell weapons. I thought that was a dumb line. I mean, that is a drastic over, like, overreaction to what he's been through, isn't it? Yeah, well, the thing... The, here's the thing, right? He could personally have been like, we need to stop selling weapons. And there could have been this whole back scene, you know, wrestle between him and... and is it Obadiah? Yeah. Yeah, oh, I can't. I couldn't remember if it's Obadiah or Obadiah. Obadiah <laughs> and like the board, there could have been this scene where he was trying to convince them, and they were like, "No, we're going to keep selling weapons anyway, and we're going to sell them on both sides because we're weapons dealers." Yeah, and then that leads him onto that. That press conference was just you, you can't do that to your stockholders. Yeah, like how many people killed themselves the next day because they had all their money wrapped up in Stark Industries? Yeah, like it was it was rash and kind of incredibly naive yeah and it was kind of out of character yeah i would because completely he agree he with that, that that was gonna happen and he thought sod it i don't care or he was just incredibly naive and didn't think it all the way through yeah i mean none of them should have been letting him have a press conference for the company no literally I think, on I think he's a very diff- seconds after person. the return flight from being in a cave for three months by the way yeah three months jeez yeah, and you would. Yeah, it felt like three months watching it. Like, <laughs> like I was surprised when he only said three months. I was like, Christ, it only been that long. <laughs> um... <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there was one thing that I did like about that storyline with him closing the weapon division of of uh, Stark Industries was it's the start of um, a storyline that follows through a lot of the films of Stark's guilt. Um. I'm obviously not going to go too much into it just now because we'll go through that more in other films. But it, upon rewatching it, it's the start of his guilt storyline that that plays a lot into his character in future films. And I like that even. And I don't know how much they had planned back then, but even back then they were they were adding this dimension to him that has then been played on in future films without feeling completely out of left field. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, I did like when he went to the arc reactor, the full size one, and Obadiah Stane came along, and he knew about the arc reactor, and uh, you you had Stark be like, "Oh, was it Rhodey or was it Pepper that told you?" Now my head canon is that it's pretty cool. Stane knew about it because of his links to the terrorists who had captured and attempted to kill Stark and not through Rhodey or Pepper. Yeah. I I like thinking about that in retrospect. Obviously, at that point in the film, you don't know that Stain had anything to do with it. But looking back on it, it's like, ah, yeah, I like the idea of that happening. So it might not even be intended, but I really like the idea of that happening. Plus, um, at the same time, though, like someone might have just been in a room with him and turned off the light. Yeah. <laughs> right like like i, I as, a, as a person who likes to sleep in total darkness i would find that whole arc reactor in the chest quite inconvenient to be honest there eh? <laughs> <clears throat> like he can't he's gonna be so shit hide and seek for the rest of his life we're talking about the real things now, eh? <laughs> yeah i mean if he was really smart as well he could get it like um chipped up so that he could have it like flash like a strobe and if he was ever like up against a villain that had issues like <laughs> what 
you're talking about epilepsy, man. <laughs> yeah. Any villain that's got epilepsy, he just starts strobing his arc reactor at them. You know, I, I, I know this meme came after, uh, and I'll send it to you if you want to include it in the video. It came after Iron Man, right? But have you ever seen that photo of the Golden Retriever that swallowed a torch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's him. That's it. And it's, yeah, I just. I think if I had one, I'd like it to, like, uh, change colour depending on my mood. <laughs> like, like one of those mood rings that you can buy. It's yeah. like, you're angry and it shows red, and you're like, this is about the calmest I've ever been. It should be blue right now. What the hell? <laughs> I think mine would be a constant, like, deep marble red. <laughs> like a very subdued but constant rage. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, I'm not even that bothered. But deep down, I'm really f***ing annoyed. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like me. Like, normally on stream, you're like, oh, I'll be 10 minutes. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Not, like, holding it against you. Or anything. It's <laughs> like, totally punching his monitor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank thank f*** for push to talk. Plus, uh, if, if, if the, the whole thing is Iron Man doesn't really work out, he could always be, like, a DJ in Ibiza. Like, that, you know, if he could get it to strobe and change colours and stuff, imagine him up on the decks. When he returned home, he obviously went for the... The closing down of the weapon division. Um, you get introduced to a character called Coulson, just sort of saying that he needs to debrief him on the on the method of his escape and stuff like that. Um, not that that character is particularly interesting at this stage, but I like pointing him out because he's one of my favourite characters in the yeah. MCU overall. As a complete casual, um, I thought he was just someone got, that got added in in one of the later films. Um, like I think I the, I first saw him in the Avengers movie. Yep. And I just thought he was a brand new character for that. So when I saw him there, cause it's been years since I watched the first Iron Man. Yeah. When I saw him there, I was like, oh. That's... I know that guy. Yeah, I know that guy. I know that guy. I, I'm sure I've met that guy. <laughs> and I just I I just thought it was nice that he was in like from the start. Yeah. Yeah, I get and you. I think, it's one of the strengths of the Marvel universe is that they use the same actors most of the time throughout the whole franchise. Yeah, and there's actually, as far as I'm, I'm really aware of it, I can only really think of two big parts that were actually replaced part way through, and one of them's Rhodey. Um, obviously, Iron Man being, I mean, overall, it's it's probably the most liked Iron Man film of the three, mm. um, but. Rhodey was obviously introduced in this and then changed in the second one. You also had um, The Incredible Hulk was played by Ed Norton in the first film and then he was recast in the first Avengers film to be I'm oddly cool with that. Mark Ruffalo. Um, we, we've had discussions about um, Ed Norton before. Yeah. I just think he's not creepy is the wrong word but just if he hadn't been an actor, like I think a lot of cats would have went missing from his hometown, <laughs> followed by a couple of hitchhikers. Like I think either you would have seen a pattern. The guy definitely has something in his basement, <laughs> right? That if you saw it, you wouldn't hang around with him anymore. Well, this YouTube channel is getting cancelled straight away before I get <laughs> uh, all these sued these are for my slander. Own. <laughs> yeah, all these these are entirely my own and not. Not the views of Captain Brun. However, <laughs> and I am again not saying that Ed Norton <laughs> is a serial killer. But if he was, does turn out to be a serial killer. You heard Paddy it here Power first. <laughs> <laughs> Paddy Power. Oh, God. Um, we then go back to Iron Man, Tony Stark, meeting up with Rhodey, trying to tell him about how he got, got away. I mean, before that, you've got the, the scene replacing the arc reactor, um, the original one, with the replacement one, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was another very cute, high chemistry scene between Pepper and Tony. Um, yeah, no, I, I, every scene that they were in was like that. It was yeah. really well done. I do think their relationship is probably one of the highlights of the film. And, and I, can, I can understand again why he asked her to do it. Like People would be like, oh, why didn't he ask a why didn't he get a big pair of forceps and get her to do it that way? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. But I understand why I asked her because she's basically a doctor. Yeah, in I mean, real life. Yeah. Um, with her views on anti-vax and steaming her own <laughs> vagina. 
Um, so I can totally understand why he chose her to do it. See, that's uh, I've said this before, but the thing I liked about Peppa Pepper Potts, I was about to say Peppa Pig, <laughs> was that I forgot she was Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, like, that's how good her performance was. You, yeah. that's a pretty good performance. Yeah, I forgot it was Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, she is a very likable uh, actress in this part, as opposed to Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> <laughs> You like what you like, don't you? Um, you know, I like if this the... YouTube channel takes off, right? One day I'm going to run into Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it, mate. Um, I'm afraid I very much doubt it. I'll find her. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. You sound like Ed Norton there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I like the, the uh, reference to Operation. Just, I used to play Operation for hours when i was younger and she didn't get the reference i was like how the f do you not know what operation is yeah i know but um, when if paltrow's parents were probably a bit no i'm, <laughs> I'm gonna go off that <laughs> stop slagging the actors <laughs> jesus she, she probably wasn't allowed to board games or something right she interfered <laughs> with the chi or the live in space or whatever right but no no yeah i thought that was weird why why would she need to say that oh i've never played operation yeah like, like i don't know what that is it's like yeah how do you not know what it is like stick your but heart tony in does here, rummage about a bit and pollute the wire i tell you to pollute Aye. it's nay rocket science <laughs> exactly all right tony's already done that <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's why you're in this problem in the first place like you've definitely got the lower maintenance job here hen <laughs> like yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, so then you get the the scene where um, Tony's trying to tell Rhodey, trying to get him in on it, and Rhodey basically snaps at him, being like, what you need is time to get your mind right. And I was like, wow, move. <laughs> like, a guy's just been held captive for three months, and you're like, no, you need to get your head sorted now. A guy's just had his first experience of what a real war zone is like, and instead of coming out and going, we need to sell more weapons to kill all these people, he comes out and goes, let's kill less people. And the let's guy, help to kill less people. Yeah, and the and guy... got shot down. The guy in the... I think it's the Air Force that, that Roddy's in. He's like, no, you can't do that. I better have a job. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, priorities, mate. Like, why, why is he not being more supportive? I don't get it. Plus, it just seems I like the, well. He's he's conditioned, isn't he? It's like when you're Aye, in the but... military, you're you're. I'm not saying everyone in the military has an out of use, but they they train you to have a certain way of thinking. Aye, but I'm sure they're also like in the military, very understanding that the general population also don't have that. Yeah, and... no, I I'm not slagging I'm not slagging them off. I can just see how that was his gut reaction. Yeah, but I it just like, however, that they've just been teaching pilots about, you know, he, he's obviously a pilot and he's he's kind of given other pilots a uh, kind of tour around the facility for yeah. one of a and then he proceeds to shoot Tony down. Yeah, like, I, that wasn't me. I didn't miss that. Yeah, I like the fact that uh, Tony's first line coming back in was a, uh, how about a man without the suit? Uh, what what about a pilot without the plane? And you're just like, ah, uh, you mean your suit? Uh. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Um. They then move on to the uh, the building man montage for um, Tony building the Mark II. I love that. I thought I it was a great every montage. Every of it. And I think the comedic timing of the robots was perfect. Yeah, I really do like that. It was when he's like, I'll just try it on 10% thrust, you know, in a concrete room with no padding. You know, I'll just try it on 10% <laughs> thrust. And he gets thrown Well, he obviously, he obviously thinks that that's like a small amount. And then yeah. it just shows you how much, like, how would... What if he had put it a hundred percent? He'd just be dead. Would I mean, that's a short, a short film. <laughs> no, I, I really liked the the building of that. I thought it was um, because you sort of saw the gradual progression of him making the 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 boots that were going to give him the most thrust, and then I'm being like, nah, I need a bit of stabilization, otherwise I can't control it. And then thinking about the the hands. Um, I also then... love that he didn't instantly know how to use it. Like, yeah, you know that scene in it's the, a bit of failure. In garage. It's you see the trial and error of it. You see him struggling to control it for the first time. You see him learning how to control it. Yeah, because I think a lot of films would have just stuck him in the suit. 
and then boom, he's an expert pilot and stuff. I, I, yeah. I, I enjoyed that whole montage. I thought it was great. Yeah, I mean, it shows his ingenuity when he, he comes up against a problem like he got thrown into the ceiling and he's instantly like, okay, well, that was too much thrust, but also I need to be able to direct this. And he goes through the, the process of them building the, the stabilizers um, on his hands and like Pepper points out, I thought you weren't making weapons anymore. He's like, this isn't a weapon. This is a flight stabilizer. And then he finds out that it can work as a weapon. And he's like, eh. Like, I like that. The fact that you almost see his thought process through that montage. Um, one thing I would say, though, is do you remember any of the music from between Back and Black till now? No, I don't. Yeah. It's one of the things that I really don't like about the film. Is the, there was nothing... The, I'm going to, for the process of these reviews, refer to the music and the score separately. The score being what I think is a sort of orchestral um, background, stuff. background stuff that's been, you know, tailor-made for that film and music being existing music that's used. For example, Black and, Black, eh, Back and Black. Which um, was almost a character, like, I think songs like that are almost a character in the scene, eh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so the, I, th I felt that their use of music in this film was good. I felt that the score in this this film was poor, very unremarkable, not very memorable at all. It's one of the letdowns because it can take a good scene to epic if you get a really good bit of music, if you know what I mean. Well, it's like those, uh, you know, the kind of fellowship theme in The Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Right. You know that, and it is just part of the score. It's not like a song, obviously, but every time something epic's happened with the fellowship, you get that, like, kind of playing in the background quite softly, and that and yeah. it adds to it. Like, it's memorable. Whereas yeah. in this, I couldn't tell you. What We've seen it recently as well with uh, Game of Thrones, the last season. It, it's not been the strongest season, not very well liked, but I don't think anyone can really sit and say that the the score in any of the episodes was bad. bad. Yeah. I, I mean it's it can save a bad thing and it can make a good thing epic. Well see score for me is more that if I don't remember it, it must have been crap. Yeah. But if I do remember it it enhanced the scene and therefore was good. Yeah, I would uh, agree with that. I mean especially with superheroes, you want a an iconic uh piece of music for that hero. And I think they they sort of fixed that later on in the MCU. So you've got stuff like um, uh, Thor's music in the first film, the first Thor film, is fairly recognisable, um, but it's not that memorable and they kind of drop it. Um, but just the style of like the Guardians of the Galaxy film and stuff like that, their use of music instead of a score, um, it's an extra dimension to those characters. I mean, you hear a song in the same vein as that, a sort of 80s song, and you're like, oh, this is probably a Guardians scene. It's it's just really good, and they missed that in this film, I think. It could have taken it from being... I mean, overall, I think this film's really good. I don't have the same issues with the first act that, that you do. Um, I think it's one of the stronger films in the MCU, especially because it was one of the earlier ones, and it doesn't have... A plethora of things to to play on in the background. It had to start from square one. Um, I think that if the music was better, it could have added another dimension. Just taking it up from like a a, a six to a, an eight um, in itself. I yeah. Think, I, do you know what I think it is? I think the problem is because I'm a casual. Viewer, I've probably only seen like the highlights of the Marvel universe. Like that's why I'm looking forward to this series because I'm going to see it all. Right. Yeah. So I'm comparing it to the the modern, polished, well established characters. They've got the formula, like you said earlier, got it nailed down. Yeah. This was this was an essay in the craft. This this was the beginning of it all. This is where these all started. And I think you wouldn't get that. I, I think my standard for a Marvel movie's higher because I'm used to the more polished ones. Yeah, I would get that. And that first forty minutes wouldn't have happened. Yeah, or wouldn't have happened that way. I mean, I think I think I've also got that. I mean, if I was to see Iron Man nowadays, I'd be like, "Yeah, it's a bad Marvel film." Like if they released it now, 
But I think, as you say, you're looking at that with the the opinion that it should be really good because they have this formula. They've done 23 films now. Like they, They're not allowed to make these mistakes. Whereas I look back on this and go, this was 10 years ago and it was the first one that they did. I'm allowing them a bit of a bit of leeway. Um, it doesn't make what you're saying wrong at all. But I mean, I would agree but you with it. The context. Yeah, I would agree with it. I just don't really have an issue with it. Um, I mean, most of your complaints, most of them are objective. Some of them are subjective, but most of them are objective. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's problems with the first act of this film, but it's it's old. It's quite frankly, it's. It's probably yeah. not aged very well comparatively to... Uh... Speaking of aging very well, though, I thought most of the special effects had. Well, yeah, that's, that's another thing about this film. Is Check it? that cute wee segue there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love a segue. <laughs> Love a segue. <laughs> um, yeah, they were great. The suit looks so good. It does. It looks... Even even the Mark One looked good. Yeah. It didn't look fake. It looked quite realistic. Like, if you were going to if you're going to play along with the idea that you could build this in a cave, it would look as sort of sh- is that? If I you think get it me. could look better, to be honest. But okay. Me. But it looked real. That's my benchmark, right? Is does it look real? Do I notice this is CGI yep. straight away? Even if I objectively know it's CGI, when I see that thing for the first time, do I wonder or do I just not think about it? Yeah. I, I like. Think I didn't think about it. I like the points in the film where you can go back and you go, I wonder if that was CGI or I wonder if that was a like a a real effect. Like whether they made a fake suit and they just sort of made him act as if he was, you know, robotically charged. Um, and, you know, the sort of walk is very machine-like and it feels like cogs are having to turn for him to be able to walk. But that, that could have been a practical effect. For all I know, at least at yeah. that first cave one, um, the Mark II becomes very much a... You can tell it's CGI, but the CGI is good. It looks like real metal. It looks like... Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's you, you can tell it's CGI, but again, it looks so good you don't care. And I mean, even yeah. when they... The only, the only bit I thought was like the CGI was a bit out of date was when, you know, when he flew... Which, again, stupid moment. And I know it kind of helped later on but when he tries to go at max altitude in his first test flight tries to beat a record i mean it's it's so tony stark I get yeah that. that's what i was about to say i like it because it's character. so in his character of let's just see what i can do and but the uh you know when the ice and stuff starts forming over now i thought that was great that was a great touch that's realistic as yep right but I thought the ice looked bad. <laughs> That's just me. Okay. I just, that, that was if I'm gonna nitpick anything in the CGI, that was the only bit of the movie where I went, meh. Yeah. But yeah, that's a tiny nitpick in the CGI. But I just thought I'd throw it in there. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I can I can get that. I like the I like the first flight scene. One of the one of my favorite effects uh, for Iron Man and Tony Stark throughout the whole MCU is the um, the HUD for him being inside the suit. I yeah. love that special effect, how you see from inside a helmet, but you don't feel really enclosed. You feel like it's obviously just his head in a dark room with the CGI put around it, but it's so good because you get to see his reaction because that's one of the problems with a lot of these characters that have like metal suits is they cannot react. It's one of the very few problems with... Um, the early Spider-Man films, is that the suit does not allow the actor to yeah. to act, apart from verbally. Um, and they, they, I mean, they, in the Spider-Man films, they end up just removing his mask all the time so he can act. Or, you know, ripping half of it to shreds and stuff like that in fight scenes. Um, they got round it. But with Iron Man, you literally cannot get away with that because realistically, if his face is is on show, he's in a lot of trouble. So you yeah. can't get away with that in this one. And I thought that was a really good idea. I don't I know who came up with it, but I it's... I never re- even thought of that. But yeah, that now that you've said that... Just logistically for the film, it allows him to act, 
when yeah, he's in the suit. That's great. I never which, I mean, it's it's really creative. It's not a, it's not a problem I would have had with the film. I don't think if they hadn't done it. But now looking back on it, with them having, <laughs> they did it. yeah, it's like yeah, it's just so much better. Um, yeah, I mean the build up, the ice build up scene is foreshadowing, but it doesn't feel like foreshadowing. Well, the thing is, it was foreshadowing, right? And then I thought when he led the big guy up there, I thought that that you know right that finally makes sense that's why we got that scene yeah ab- above and beyond oh that's tony stark and then that's not what beat him yeah so i was a bit, like see if that see if there'd been an epic fight scene and then that's how he'd beat him i think that would have been more satisfying than the, the arc reactor explosion to be honest i would but agree with that me. but um i would also point out the fact that this film came out in the absolute height of blue beam in the sky final boss battles uh, films, which was a problem with a lot of films, but mainly superhero films, where every finale had to have a blue beam going into the sky <laughs> and a boss fight to the death. Um, I agree with you. I feel like that would have been a better ending. Um, you could have had the boss fight on the roof, blue beam into the sky, and then have him survive that, and then yeah. take them up to the the highest altitude. So that it was clearly Tony's mind that won, rather than just his... It's kind of pot luck at the end. I mean, he, he thought that they were both going to die when the arc reactor went off. And it he didn't kill him. Here, didn't he? Yeah. I mean, that was just luck. I mean, he should have been dead, based on the rules that he had said 30 seconds before. But I think, especially in these sort of films, when... When you have a villain which is a mirror copy of the hero, you need to show why the hero's better. And in some cases you can get away with it just being the moral side is better. So this hero wins because he's, you know, because morals. But when it comes to two really smart people, you should just show that he is smarter. He wins the day because he's got more experience. He's just a a more intelligent person. And if he decides, like, yeah. I mean, cutting a long story short, I think they should have ended with Obadiah dying to fall damage <laughs> yeah. from ice and up. Word, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I, I think that would have been a cooler end. And it would have, when I saw that and I was like, oh, that, that's a good callback to an earlier part in the film. Yeah. Like that whole sequence now makes much more sense and the fact that like you're saying he was building up experience he had more experience with a suit and what it could do and what it couldn't and this guy had just went for brute force with yeah. his suit it was a complete weapon of war yep um and yeah i just think that would have been a better ending not that i hated the end um, yeah it wasn't bad i just think now in retrospect it could have been just that little bit better just by f- even as i say just flipping those scenes around almost um, yeah you, exactly. you could have done it just that little bit better and it, at least in my opinion other other people might completely disagree with that and say it's a perfect film but it's you know I think that's subjective I like the fact that they had the payoff for that line but I do think that it could have been used slightly better yeah we then get out of the suit and Tony goes to this event that's been held by him that he doesn't know about um, and you have Stan Lee's first cameo as yeah. being uh, mistaken for, for Hugh yeah. Hefner. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was pretty good. Yeah, I, I liked it. I, I mean, there's not many of the Stanley cameos that I don't like in the MCU because you know that they're just there for fun. They're not there to have anything to do with the story. They're just there for fun. It leads into the, the scene with Tony and Pepper Um having a dance together, then going to the balcony and almost having their first kiss. There's a lot of, like I've said this before, there was a lot of good chemistry Yeah. in that scene. Like, yeah, I it mean... It was believable that they were both kind of fighting the urge to... I think that... Go- it, it shows the strength of these two actors in those and those two parts. Mm-hmm. These f- scenes could have been so boring 
if they had no chemistry, it would have been so tedious. But they were fun. Gwyneth Paltrow, by the way, in that dress, that backless dress, oft. Can't say much more than that, just oft. I can't say much more about it without probably getting tarred. <laughs> <laughs> that Me Too movement. <laughs> right, when no, you're back again. I, I, Gwyneth Paltrow is an incredibly attractive woman. She's it's just not my type at all. Just Fair enough. I so like it wasn't a moment for me, like where I was like, oh my god! I was like, it was more for me. It was like, oh, she's wearing a nice dress. All right, fair enough. I can get that. No, it was um, more Tisha Adams in that dress. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're not getting sidetracked with a top five list of women in the world. <laughs> right, coming up on the Garter Snipe Gaming YouTube channel, top five women in. The world. <laughs> Top five fantasy women in scantily clad outfits. That is definitely one way to get demonetized and then oh, yeah, no, me too out of <laughs> out of YouTube. <laughs> I'll maybe never upload it, I'll just keep it for myself. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Don't want to know what you're gonna use it for though, but hey. I think it's pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we then move on, thankfully, <laughs> to the next scene in the film where Tony goes on his first mission. Um, I don't know if you remember, but the the name of the town that he decides to go and save is Chimera, which is the place that Jensen was from. Ah, is that what it was? Yeah, um, and that's why he got so angry so quickly. Not only that, but he, he noticed the same guy um, from the Ten Rings that he had burnt half of his face off with a mist... Uh, missed kill attempt um mm-hmm. yeah i mean he he just sort of goes in head first he knows his suit's bulletproof and he just goes up and punches things i mean is he is really strong at this point compared to what he's up against yeah he was completely you know he and he was knows completely it overpowered yeah he was and he and he knew it and it was quite reckless yeah definitely in some ways. yeah i mean if but he didn't if he didn't have that that multi-target bullet thing on his shoulders, um, he could have gotten all four of those people killed that yeah. were, were in the lineup in front of the, the truck. I think there was somebody else in the truck being held hostage as well. But, you know, they all could have died almost instantly if he didn't have that built into his suit. He, well, I he, forgot he had that, so I was like, oh, you're snookered now, eh? Well, I can't, um, I can't remember them actually discussing it in the film, in the montage or anything like that for him having that put in. No, and I'm kind of glad that they didn't. I, I don't want to see every... I don't want them to, like, hard... Like, I don't want to have a hard list of what that suit can do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Takes away a bit of the mystery and stuff, and I, I, I fully believe that he's probably designed it. It is modular. You see him putting it together and... Yeah. Bits. Yeah. So it would be quite easy to swap stuff like that out. You know, I mean, he could probably put the flamethrowers back on if he really wanted to. Yeah, that would be so dumb, though. <laughs> yeah, no, it was so dumb the first time. <laughs> yeah, but you can understand he's in a cave. He's probably just like, let's get as much good stuff that I can get into this as possible. Yeah, that's true. That's um, true. Yeah, um, put down as a training exercise as by Rhodey um, after the, the return from there. They have the plane scene. I, I like that. Seeing him go up against... Some real military hardware run by real military professionals. Yeah, I liked it. I thought visually it was really good. It shows him thinking on his feet as well. I just think they were very quick to take it out. It was it was kind of a, it kind of showed you the human reaction that if I don't understand something and it scares me, I'm gonna destroy it. Yeah. Yeah. Considering it hadn't attacked them, it had attack. It had clearly shown its intent to destroy for want of a better term, they're enemies and save innocent people, and their first reaction was to shoot down. Yeah. Um, I get that. I mean, I get the the uh, the army guy getting really annoyed when he had accidentally, from our point of view, taken down one of the jets, and the guy was falling without a parachute. Um, I, I get that the army guy was in like, no, if you get a shot on him, take it out. Yeah, I get. I get. You know, he's been he's been ultra defensive, but yeah, before that, it's it's he did jump the gun a bit. I think the motivation for the scene was a bit meh, but the when he actually saves the guy in the parachute with it in the ejector seat with the parachute, yeah, that kind of 
It shows this heroic side straight yeah. away. It shows because that he's got morals. A, 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 you know, top of the line fighter jet. And I tame one of them out. They've just been trying to kill me. I think the average Joe's not really thinking about the guy who's came out. Like yeah. The, the, you know. There's I actually a line like, as well where Jarvis is like, I think he's like, um, they're locking on to us or something like that. Yeah. And Tony's yeah, like, like keep going. Yeah. 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 Um, because he's, he's like, no, I need to save this guy. He's clearly his parachute's not coming out, so he's going to die. I'm not letting that guy die. He's not a bad guy. Mm. Um, which is good. It shows a moral compass. It was a cool scene, as you say. Visually, looked good. Um, I didn't have any issues with the CGI in that scene either, which was no, impressive. No, uh, yeah, it all looked good. Um, bit of chemistry between Rhodey and, and Tony as well. I mean, I've said I'm not a huge fan of this version of Rhodey, but that was a highlight in their relationship throughout the film for me. Um, yeah. I felt like they, they seemed like old buddies when they were talking on the phone during that scene. And there was a kind of there was a callback to that moment later on in the film, uh, you know, during the boss fight, for want of a better word. Rory's like, no need to scramble the jets. It's just yeah. A training exercise. Yeah. I thought that was good. That that was good. You yeah. can tell he came around to the idea of all yeah. this. From, yeah. I think as soon as he sees it as well, and he's like, nah, maybe next time. <laughs> Not I for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No right. <laughs> it's a shame, but. Um, yeah, you have you then have fallen on from that, you've got the scene where uh, Tony sends Pepper to Stark Industries to download all the information um, and that's where you find out the, the twist with Obadiah that he actually was the one that, that paid him uh, the, the ten rings to, to kill this guy without telling him who it was and then they find out it was Tony Stark and that's why they just sort of kidnapped him rather than just killing him straight away they were wanting more money and stuff like that, so you get that twist. I mean, that's fine. It was it wasn't a particularly hidden twist. I was yeah, exactly. Sure he had something to do with it from the it start. was a it was a loose twist. Um, yeah, but you didn't. I mean, as much as you were, probably. I mean, I think I got to the stage where I was like, yeah, he doesn't seem like he's going to be particularly helpful to Tony. I didn't, as far as I can remember, the first time I watched it, I didn't think that he was going to have been the one that paid for the assassination attempt on him in the first place. I just felt like he was a businessman and he was going to be taking advantage of the opportunity that, that came to be because of Tony not being, you know, in a, yeah. a sound mental state. Yeah, you... more like a yes man than anything else. Yeah. You then had the scene with uh, Obadiah meeting the Ten Rings leader and using the paralysis machine, which, by the way, that is never, ever used again in the MCU. Dude, it's weird. I didn't like it. It's weird, and I hate the noise that it makes on screen. Oh my the noise, god! The, like, I can understand if it was some sort of sonic device that caused like temporary paralysis or something like that. But the whole vein thing it did as well. Yeah. I was like, just use a serum or some. <laughs> like at that point, if you, it, it makes no Trank sense. Dark. It make, yeah, use something like that. Just yeah. kind of. And why did he freeze that guy when they were just gonna kill them all anyway? I like that I... was just to set it up for using it later. I That's think so, was. yeah, so that it wasn't completely out of the blue. Yeah, I just, yeah, no, meh, I didn't enjoy that, that whole, Yeah, I enjoyed the office scene, I thought the tension in it was awesome. Yep. Um, and I thought, I thought, to be honest, when, she, when he when he first came into the room, I thought he'd seen what Peppa was looking at. Yep. Uh, she seemed suitably uncomfortable, but I thought he'd seen what she was looking at. Yeah, I get that. Um, when... And I liked how she quickly, subtly put it onto her screensaver and kind of... Used the like, paper yeah, to hide the YouTube, the USB stick and stuff like that. And I liked how she was coming out of the office. There was a lot of tension when he, you see him realise what she's done. Yep. And he knows he can't go... Ape. Yeah. Like, he can't just tell security to lock down the building. Because then that raises questions, what has she done? Yeah. It points lights and stuff. And as she meets Agent Coulson as she's coming outside... And she knows that she's been caught as well. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice dynamic. Yeah, because he's got all the power, but she's like also her. like barely able to just be like, "I'm actually safe right now, but yeah. I need to get out of here. I can't be in a room alone with him now that he knows." Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then yeah, you've got the reintroduction of Coulson. I mean, he's so polite. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, Miss Potts, we have a meeting right now. She's like, "You're getting it now," and he's like, "Oh, oh okay." <laughs> it's just, oh, I love Coulson. I love him so much. 
yeah, yeah. Out of all the pop vinyls I've got, I've I've actually got a Colson one. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's so good. <laughs> um, you then get introduced to the Ironmonger suit, which I don't know if they actually mentioned the fact that that was his name in the film. But um, there was one point where Obadiah says to Tony, "We're Ironmongers," um, and that is the comic book villain is called Ironmonger. So mm-hmm. we'll call him that. Um, overcompensate much? Yeah, definitely. But it but seems I, like his I character think it was designed to kill Tony's suit. It yeah, was designed to top his suit. Yeah, it's but also what you'd imagine of. Sorry, you, go on. You wanted to top the best thing. Yeah, yeah, I think as well. It's a, it's a sign of his mental state, where he, having been second, to a Stark for years, would probably be like, "What makes something cool? Like, oh, let's make it big." Do you know what I mean? Do you know as well as that that like, um, you know when they break, you know when Coulson and and Pepper, um, break into his, like sections at section sixteen. Yep. His lab, right? There was all this. Like, I know it's for atmosphere and stuff, but there was all this, like... Like, see if I was working on a robotic suit that advanced, right? I'd want good lighting, right? <laughs> yeah. I'd also want all those random chains hanging down from the ceiling to be caught. <laughs> now, I, I know that in some, like, loading docks and stuff, they have those over doors and shit, but, like, you don't... It, it, was, it was almost... And there was, like, water effects and stuff. Like, there was obviously some water in there that was causing, like, yeah. light reflection and stuff. But it's like, wait, hang on. This guy's basically second in command of a huge weapons, like design facility, right? Why? <laughs> why is he working in the sewer? <laughs> yeah. Why does it feel like he's working in an absolute sh- hole? <laughs> yeah, and it's like I get that they've kind of got to set it up that you know he's the anti Iron Man, he's the evil Tony, um, but yeah, I just thought that that kind of. I like the scene where like Pepper is. I nearly said it again there. <laughs> where Pepper is like looking at the darkness and suddenly like his eyes and stuff just light up. Yeah. And you see the scale of it and stuff. Ah, he sort and of stands up. It was really cool as she was running to the door that he can't just get to her. Like he gets, you know, his own shitty office and beating him because it was like reinforced concrete walls. Yeah. You just see him try to grab it as he, like, I thought that set him up as like a monster. Like yeah. A it was Kong. very, it was, yeah, horror vibey. Which I think yeah. is a very good way to introduce your villain in pretty much any film. Is the hanging chains? Yeah, it was dumb. I did think that at some points where I was like, what's the hanging chains for? I think at some points I sort of put it down to, oh, if he's been holding up the Mark I, because he's now got the Mark I from the Ten Rings and when they, they collected it from the desert, maybe he's using them to sort of hoist things up. I don't know. It does. There seems like he would have access to robotic and kind of um, hydraulic equipment that could, yeah, do all that. I mean, it's it's maybe one of these situations where you, they're just putting it in to look cool, and then they've made it dark so that you don't actually get to know what they're supposed to, what their in-universe explanation is, so that you don't need to then be like, "Well, that's f- dumb." <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, that's basically the start of the fight scene that then. Is the rest of the the film effectively? Um, do you know what the Do you know what the most annoying thing about the whole fight scene was? What the middle aged mum <laughs> running over Tony? The, yeah, like so you can like I'm sorry, right? I know she was terrified. Her and her children were about to die, right? I can't imagine a more terrifying scenario, right? Yeah, but you see the big evil guy pick you up and about to smash you. The other one attacks him, picks up your car and then lowers you back onto the ground and her first reaction was to run him over. <laughs> right? I think it was just was put the so foot down annoying. and get out of there. I would have killed her if I was like Iron Man <laughs> just to prove a point. Right? <laughs> Nobody does that to me. <laughs> sorry, sorry, No, no. Sorry, kids. Look, your mum was an idiot. <laughs> this is what happens to idiots in my world. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did like the fight scene overall. Um... I felt like it went on a bit. There was almost like a few different stages. There was a fight scene on the road that ended with them then going up into the sky. Um, Do you not think the whole premise for it was a bit stupid though? Like if I was if I was Obadiah, I I've designed this suit. Right, the 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 shield agents have discovered what I've done. 
Pepper's discovered what I've done, etc. My first thought wouldn't be to go on a city-wide rampage in a walking monster robot to, like, you know... Yeah. Even if he won that fight, even if he killed Pepper at that point, or defeated Tony or whatever, right? He's still now a criminal, and he can't sell that seat. Well, I think and... the, the concept of it was that he found out that Tony had found out it was him that mm -hmm. did everything. Pepper now had the proof that it was him. So I think in his mind, if he kills both of them, nobody knows that it's him. Okay, Spanrunner works with the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. Um, but I think that's the gist of it, is that he thinks he can cover this up before it gets out that he's a villain. And yes, the, the Ironmonger suit might then be villainous, but he could sell it on the black market and just make it untraceable to him. And then See, I don't know, right? Because I think if I had a super weapon it, like that basically trumped everything in the world, right? My first thought, even if I knew how much money I could make off of it, my first thought would be if I give this to everyone else, they might destroy me with it. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit like a... Like, to put it into something I understand, like, the Death Star in Star Wars, right? Yep. There's no way the Emperor would have shared that technology with anyone. Right? Yeah, but the the, em the, the Emperor is not an ironmonger. <laughs> like, this guy has literally spent his whole life, sell whole life selling weapons yeah, for money. True. I don't think he's ever been a um, I want to rule the world sort of character. It's one of the things that I quite like about this this villain is that he's not a maniacal guy. He's he's trying to kill his partner to take over the company that he's been working on for years and years and years. And then he finds out about this suit and he's like, this is a great weapon. I can, I can change this. I can sell it. Problem being that two people now know that I paid to try and have Tony killed and mm -hmm. one of them now has proof of it. So I need to get my arson gear, kill those two, and then I can put a lid on this. I can change it, sell it, you know. I can say, oh, I, you know, when you go to sell it, you can be like, well, I didn't have anything to do with the first one, but, like, it was fairly easy to copy and for me. And a darker me. thought that I've just had as, you were, as we were thinking about this just now is that if he had one, if Ironmonger had won and killed Tony Stark and Pepper, Yep. Um, if he agreed to a like a, an exclusive deal with the the U.S. military, yep, then they would have probably done the same train and exercise cover up. Yeah, they they, they would not because, have. Yeah, because the weapons technology would have been so. Yeah, we, I've plugged. I mean, all, shield all, wouldn't all, shield wouldn't yeah. have because shield are made out to be this really nice, you know, for the whole world uh, team rather than just like the the CIA or the the FBI or something like that, but the US military would definitely have taken that that but deal. Because, and that does, I'm not demonising the US military. If you're looking at it just as a tactical thing, that's the best tactical move. Yeah, I mean, them not taking the weapon isn't going to bring Tony Stark back. And also, yeah. they don't technically know that Tony Stark's been the good guy in this. I mean, to them, Obadiah could be like, no, I had to kill him because he was trying to kill thousands of people. And my suit yeah. managed to stop his suit. You can and edit that narrative to yeah. make him look like the hero. So yeah, no, I, I understand now why. Yeah, it was he was playing for all or nothing. Yeah, at and that point. One of the things I'd like to point out about the action and the final battle is that it was all pretty slow paced in a way that made it easy to follow. Not really yes. slow paced; it felt snail pace, but it felt slow enough that it was really easy to follow. Which, I mean, a lot of action films are really bad at putting like shaky cam in. You don't need that in these films, if the CGI is good anyway. And I, I don't know about you, but when uh, when he grabs Tony, and he's like trying to crush him, like I could feel that. Oh yeah. Like the the way the armor started to buckle and stuff looked real. Yeah. Like it was almost like I felt a tin can. Looking at that, yeah, yeah, it it was really. I thought that was. I actually think the whole fight sequence was sequence was really well done. Well, I'm glad because, yeah, I mean, these films quite a lot of the time live or, 
hanging on my opinion. <laughs> no, a lot of these films live or die by their finales. And a, a poor finale, even on a, a an amazing first two acts, can completely kill a film. Whereas you can have a slow start and a great ending and the film still be looked at as a good film overall. Yeah, which is what I would say about this one. Yeah. Um. So yeah, after the action scene, you then get the the reintroduction of Coulson for the third time, um, who points out the fact that they're no, now calling themselves S.H.I.E.L.D. rather than the strategic I homeland. That. I saw it coming. Blah, 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 blah. It. Yeah, it's good. I liked it. It was a nice cheeky wee line. It, um, made, me, it made me smile. It made me grin. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the I am Iron Man scene. The end. That line. We'll see in future films. It plays a part. Yeah, I thought I thought that was really good, and in a way, I kind of liked that he kind of. I know it wasn't his main motivation, but it was a way of shutting up that Vanity Fair. <laughs> yeah, because like she's not. That's not investigative journalism, I would say. Right, that's more like inflammatory journalism. Like she's trying to get him to do or say something that then she can run with. Yeah, rather than actually try to get to the truth of the matter. Yeah, and it was just like sod it. I'm Iron Man. I loved it. And I thought it fits so well with Tony's character as it well. It is very much his character that he would be like, no, this is me. This is who I am. I don't care what you think. This is me. Yeah. Um, but he is a very egotistical character throughout the whole film. And that... I mean, it also solves the problem in future films of them having to deal with this stupid storyline that a lot of superheroes of have. Of, oh, I can't yeah. have my alter ego found out. Which then they spend a whole lot of time trying to tie tie up loose ends of people that might know about it. I like the fact that they just went, nah, he he would say that he is Iron Man. And it suits his character. It saves that plot line um, for a more apt character like like uh, Peter Parker as Spider-Man. Like, I think it works for Spider-Man and stuff. I kind of love how most of them have abandoned that alter ego thing as the yeah. Avengers and stuff moved on because when I honestly I, I I can't wait till we get to Thor Ragnaros because Ragnarok sorry because I'm gonna have literally nothing but good things to say about it right yeah but that scene where they're just walking around New York Loki and Thor and like people are coming up for selfies and it's like oh sorry sorry she dumped you and stuff like it's just like they're people yep yeah I, I like that I do I like that, that. yeah I mean that that I don't think they could do that in the early stages of the MCU. No, but after the events of like Avengers One, Avengers Two, like these characters would be known worldwide, and a lot of people would not necessarily worship them, but they'd be like your top celebrities. Yeah. Um. So their faces would definitely be known. Um, I think as well for modern audiences, you can't really get away with that Superman Clark Kent cliche, where literally all he does is put on a pair of glasses and change into a suit. Yeah, like I don't think modern audiences would buy that anymore. Yeah, like they, I mean they that that, that only applies to some it. characters. Like you could definitely get away with it with Iron Man because he's in a metal suit. You can't see a single part of his flesh. You could use yeah. a voice digitizer to change it slightly so that he didn't sound anything like Tony Stark. The only way that you would catch him out is if he said something that showed like. I think that Tony, Tony Stark's Tony. character is so strong though, and so he, his vocal patterns and the way. The words he chooses and stuff are so integral to his character that you'd still be able to tell. Oh yeah, so I possibly. Think they, I think they, I think they went with a great move there, and like uh, you say, yeah. they trimmed the fat of the story as well. Yeah, but it was just like sod it, I'm Iron Man. It it was a great ending as well. Yeah, and, and then uh, it cuts to, me? well, it cuts to Iron Man, Iron Man by Black Sabbath, which is a great piece of music, anyway. You know, it's a classic rock song. It was a good end of movie rock song. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then end, end credit scene. Nick Fury shows up. I nearly forgot to watch it. Good old I, Samuel L. Jackson. I nearly forgot to to watch it, and then I remembered it's a Marvel film. Yeah. <laughs> I nearly forgot, and I was like, oh, shit, I better go back and watch it, because Brune's going to kick my ass if I don't, eh? Well, see, I, <laughs> when I first saw this film in, in the cinema, end credit scenes weren't a thing. I went home. Yeah, I never saw it. Like, no one knew. Yeah, yeah, so it was the first time I'd seen it as well, eh? So it was like, oh, I wonder if they started doing this all the way at the start. Yeah. 
I liked it. I I, I like Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. Um, a lot. I, I think him. it's really hard not to like him. Yeah. I and I like that because again, the first time I saw Nick Fury was Avengers. Yeah. And this so, he actually um, mentions it straight away. It's like the yeah, Avengers initiative. Yeah, but, because I'm sure there's a few throwaway lines in later films where it's like uh, I think it's in Avengers where uh, Nick Fury's talking to Stark about the Avengers initiative and he's like, No, I told you the first time I don't want anything to do with it or whatever. I don't want anything it's, to do with uh, it. It's it's Iron Man two that, that happens. It's Iron Man yeah. two? Right, yeah. okay. So yeah. I'm there's a bit, a bit more of a conversation about it um, than the sort of one line that they get at the end of the film there. But, I mean, what's your thoughts? Summarise it for me. Yeah, give me a Summarize, wee spiel. Yeah. Um, first act, well, at least the first 45, 48, 45 minutes, I was bored. I was checking the time. Okay. Right? I didn't enjoy that at all. Uh, but once he kind of gets out of the, once we get into the rest of the film, I thought it really picked up pace. I thought it became visually more exciting. I thought it become a more interesting movie. I really liked the the middle and the end. Fair enough. I thought the beginning was really slow, and I, I, despite what I've said about Gwyneth Paltrow, I think she was really good in this movie. Like like I said, you for you, the chemistry between her and Robert Downey Jr. was just perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Overall, I liked it. I really liked it. I, I don't know Fair where enough. I'm going to give it on the rating system, but what Fair did enough. you think? Well, I, I, I mean, I love this film. It's one of the first films that I really enjoyed uh, as a superhero film um, because prior to that, it had stuff like the X-Men where they went with black leather instead of the sort of spandex-coloured suits, um, which is kind of like shitting on the source material, for lack yeah. of a better phrase. Whereas this one, I felt the the kind of while making it realistic, they really did stick to the the sort of look of him with the bright red and yellow. Like, they just went for it. They just made it make sense to that character. So, for example, when he was all flashy and stuff like that, and even Jarvis mentions the fact that, oh, you're usually so low-key and stuff like that when it's going to be yeah. bright gold. And he's like... It's very ostentatious. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, think, I don't know where I got that, that idea from. And it, then he goes... Add in some hot rod red, and Jarvis is like, "Yeah, that'll fix it." <laughs> like, yeah. it's so within character for him that. Side note: I think Jarvis is a great character. Oh, I love Jarvis as well. Absolutely love him. I'm sad that we ended up having to get rid of Jarvis, but yeah, voice actors and stuff. We'll get onto that in later films, but yeah, Jarvis is great. A great foil for Tony as well. Yeah. Um, in conversations. Well, I just want to say straight off the bat then that I'm going to be brutal with these. Okay, fair right? enough. I'm going to judge them against the best of Marvel. Yeah. And if they're early. Right? I wouldn't, ju- really I wouldn't judge I wouldn't judge them the against whole. the best films ever, but I would judge them against the best superhero films that you can think of. Yeah. So that so that because I don't want to I I wouldn't want to like give with all the kind of criticisms I had of this film, despite it being quite a good film, I don't want to then go, ah, oh, four stars, right? I, I don't want to give it... Because then, what where's left to go? Yeah. Like, I mean, the, the way I'm the looking at like it Morgan. is one star is pretty sh- mm-hmm. Two stars is pretty bad. Three stars is boring or just meh. Like, you don't really have a positive or negative view on the film. It's just there. Mm-hmm. Four would be pretty good. Five would be very good. And six would just be like immense. Okay, well, I'm gonna break the mold slightly. I'm gonna give it three and a half cans iron brew. All right, fair enough. I because I don't think it's meh. It just existed. I enjoyed a lot of it, but I don't think it's four stars. All right, that's I can go with that. Um, Is that okay? Yeah, I mean, I would say four stars personally because I didn't have the same issues with the first act that you did. Yeah, and I think that would take it up at least just I'd probably say at least half a star. I don't think it's one of the better films in the MCU, so I'm not going to give it five. Um, and it's definitely well, really it's definitely not worth a six. I'm really looking forward to all the viewers in the in the comment section agreeing with one of us or the other. <laughs> we should make that a thing. I'm better than you. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I, I agree. But yeah, let's let's go. Let's are, go with that. Are you Anyone Team Bruin or Team Shawnee? <laughs> Hashtag yeah. gutter snipe. Hashtag Captain Burn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's let let's see what you guys think. Yeah. Right. Because I know I'm right. Right. <laughs> but it would be nice to get a bit of vindication. Oh so, yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Um. So yeah. Next up, 
Incredible Hulk with your favourite actor in the world, Ed Norton. <sighs> yeah, I mean, this is... These are the ones I have to force myself. That, you know what? I'm probably going to enjoy. It. It's just you've said Ed Norton. Now, don't tell me Gwyneth Paltrow's in it as well. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I can't even remember the actress's <laughs> name that plays a love interest in Incredible Hulk. Only be that movie for one steamy. C- <laughs> 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 Holy shit! Oh, I don't know God. if you can include that. Right? I, I that probably was... won't include that. <laughs> That's a hard C. That was a hard C. Uh, that's good, but um, yeah, we'll 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 go on to Incredible Hulk next week, um, or next time, and then after that it becomes a bit easier. But this is the one I'm dreading the most, to be quite honest. But everyone, thank you for watching. Um, thank you. Let us know what you thought of the film down below. Let um, us know exactly how right you thought I was. Yeah. That would be. And give me some votes because I'm better than Sean. So. Give him some votes because he needs this. <laughs> I do need this. <laughs> right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.